So without further ado, we're, it's the same system as you had in the previous rooms, six minutes per speaker. Um, keep your notes, take questions, and um, we'll hold them all till the end. At the end of the six speakers, you will get some time in a small group to reflect on what you've heard, to decide what your most critical and urgent questions are. I'd encourage you to use your critical thinking skills, really think about what you're hearing and what you need clarification on. Um, you've got your Royal Commission documents as well. Um, I think there's a few extras outside, so if anyone wants one, I'm sure John could nip out and grab us another Royal Commission report. Um, so please use, use critical thinking skills, Let's listen to the speakers and then we should get a full half hour at the end for question and response. <coughs> Sound okay? Great. I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to our first speaker, John Loy. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mel, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appear in the programme as an alternate for Carl Magnus Larsen, CEO of our Panzer. Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency. I need to emphasise, however, that I am not speaking based upon I'm speaking based upon my own experience as a radiation and nuclear safety regulator, and I'm not um, speaking for our Panzer as such, though I hope Carl Magnus will agree with what I shall say. My basic thesis that I wish to put to the jury is that any recommendation to proceed, even in an exploratory fashion, should be accompanied by a requirement that a regulatory legal framework for a good regulator be established. So what does a nuclear and sa radiation safety regulator actually do? And what are some of the characteristics of a good regulator? Well, first of all, they make regulations. They create regulations that are binding on the operator, in particular for waste storage and disposal. These would spell out the need for and coverage of what is called the safety case, the facility to be licensed. Regulations should also require a strong management system to be applied by the operator. The regulator then reviews and assesses proposals for construction and operation of the facilities. This is to determine that sufficient information is supplied to satisfy the regulator, that the safety criteria established in the regulations will be met with a high degree of confidence. This process usually involves the regulator seeking additional information from the applicant. In other words, there's a to and fro process rather than simply one single assessment. Having reviewed and assessed the application, the, the regulator then makes a licensing decision. Usually there are two stages in a licensing process, one for construction of a facility, which focuses on this, the being satisfied with approving the site and the satisfaction with the design of the facility and for operation, approving the operating plans and arrangements. The fundamental license condition is that the operator must do what it says it will do in the approved application. It must do what it says it will do. It cannot deviate from its own arrangements. Reporting requirements and the handling of modifications are also usually covered in license conditions and other, other instances as well. But regula regulation cannot simply be a paper process. It is important that the regulator gets out there and see, sees what is actually happening at the management level, at the construction or operation site, and in the supply chain. Inspectors may actually reside at the site as well as come from headquarters. Inspectors need to be special people with personal skills as well as technical skills. There may be a channel for whistleblowers to come forward. And finally, the regulator undertakes enforcement action. So it takes action to ensure that non-compliances, whether identified by inspectors or by the operator and reported to the regulator, are fixed. The regulator needs strong legal powers to be able to stop work if necessary and to enforce compliance. Fines and penalties are also a weapon in the armory of the regulator. So what makes a good regulator? Independence is vital, obviously from any interest involved in the promotion of nuclear activity and it should be the regulator's decision to issue or not issue licenses and apply conditions without interference by others. What makes a good regulator? They certainly need to be technically competent and understand the sciences and engineering involved. <coughs> but the staff of the regulator need not be expert in every field related to the facility, but they certainly need to be able to be intelligent customers of technical support organisations. 
They need to be committed to peer review within the global nuclear safety and international global nuclear and radiation safety regime. The peer review mechanism established through the review meetings of the Joint Convention are an important international health check on national regulators and operators. The IAEA also offers more detailed peer review services conducted against the IAEA safety standards. Transparency is another characteristic of a good regulator. A high degree of transparency is essential to provide public confidence in the regulatory system. The slides list some of the basic measures of transparency, but the regulator needs to pay special attention to communities directly affected by the facility and also needs to be accountable to the parliament. A final characteristic of a good regulator, I'm sure there are many others, but this is all, all my list, is an understanding of the relationship with the operator. It's important that a regulator not assume the operator's prime responsibility for safety. The operator is primarily responsible for safety, he must own the safety case and encourage a good safety culture. What about security? That will be covered really by my friend Stefan Bayer shortly, and, but it needs to be regulated on a similar basis to safety. So I reiterate my recommendation to the citizens jury that any recommendation that South Australia continue with development of the proposal be contingent on action to create a regulatory legal framework and to commence building a good regulator. It is not too early to start. Thank you. Okay, I have some feedback that this is hard to hear, so I'm going to try and get it a bit higher. But if speakers can also just be aware, you might need to lean into the mic a little bit. Um, John has set the bar high. He stopped with 43 seconds to go, <laughs> so no pressure. But yeah. There we go. Uh, Dr. Margaret Beavis. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. If people at the back find I'm difficult to hear, can you wave at me? Okay, um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners because it's been the Aboriginal people who've borne the brunt of the nuclear industry in Australia and are likely to bear the brunt of it again. I'm a GP from Melbourne. I'm president of the Medical Association for Prevention of War. I tutor in medicine and I also lecture in public health, including on nuclear waste issues at Melbourne Uni. Two points I'd like you to take away from my talk today. One is that radiation above background levels is harmful for health. And the second is that accidents do happen. And in fact, they usually happen. And in fact, in storing high level waste so far, nobody has managed to get it right. There is controversy about low dose radiation and health. However, it is like climate change. There is widespread consensus, but there are some dissenting voices and including on this panel. I'll start with an example that you're all familiar with. When you walk into a ra an x-ray place, they ask you if you are pregnant. We've known since the late 50s that there are increased rates of cancer from abdominal x-rays. The baby in a mother's stomach, a, a fetus, is very highly sensitive to radiation, and there are 40% increase in cancers in these children, particularly leukemia. <clears throat> um, it's worth looking at very large studies in humans. This particular study came out in 2005, looking at over 400,000 industry workers. They found that 1 to 2% of deaths in this group exposed to low-dose radiation had cancers that they otherwise would not have. A similar study came out in 2015, this time with 8.2 million person years, so an enor enormous amount of experience. They showed that 80% of leukemia deaths were responsible, were caused by low-dose radiation exposure compared to the normal population who didn't work in radiation areas. Shows evidence of health to harms at low doses, and it shows evidence of it being worse for females and worse for children. This graph is used to um, illustrate for doctors to try and get us to use less CAT scans. A man having a heart CAT scan, one in 500 will get a cancer they otherwise wouldn't have because of that CAT scan. For a baby girl, less than one year old, one in 100 will get cancer that otherwise wouldn't have because of having that CAT scan. This slide is used by Australian College of GPs to educate GPs to get us to use less CAT scans. It comes from the Inter International Atomic Energy Agency. So this is showing, demonstrating that there are clear health concerns with low-dose radiation. From, um, the international consensus is clear. Lots of people quote this study because it was done in America by a very independent panel looking at a huge amount of data. And this demonstrated there is no safe lower dose additional above radiation levels. That in fact, 
A little bit more gives you a little bit more risk. A lot more gives you a lot more risk. The nuclear industry is very optimistic. It's a bit like the drug companies. There's no accidents and very few people mention that there are no safe, no working high level waste dumps anywhere in the world. If you want to find out about nuclear accidents, please Google Let the Facts Speak Nuclear, which is a, a long list of nuclear accidents around the world. This is an illustration of Fukushima exploding. Why have I put this up? Because the official investigation by the Japanese parliament found that Fukushima was a man-made accident, that they were advised twice in the decade before it happened that they, would be, they were at risk of tsunami, but building a better wall was going to be very expensive. The company thought it was very expensive. The company had a very cosy relationship with the Japanese regulator and the Japanese parliament. They were not forced to build the wall, and hence when the accident happened, we now find that over 100,000 Japanese people are unable to return to their homes. Um, human nature also got, sometimes just get, plain gets things wrong. The Germans are currently unpacking all the nuclear waste from their, uh, the mines they've put it in because they found that the radiation was leaking into the water table, which they had not expected. With regard to cosy relationships between government and politicians leading to poor regulation, Olympic Dam in South Australia is a current local example, and there are other examples in South Australia. You need, just need to look at the nuclear uh, waste at Maralinga, at Port Pirie, and Arkarula. Um, human Nature 3, extremist attack is unlikely, but nuclear facilities overseas have been targets for attack. Much more likely, sadly, is mental illness with someone from inside the industry or outside the industry um, causing problems. In Finland, um, there's no waste, so there's no mistakes yet. It's a bit like, some of you may remember the television show Yes Minister, where the hospital that got the prize for being the best hospital was the one that had no patients. Um, the Finnish facility, um, they're reducing the risk for Finnish people. For uh, Australia, we are importing risk. The medical research in a nutshell, a lot of human-based studies um, that support increased risk of harm with increased radiation and that there's no safe lower dose. The nuclear industry is fairly unforgiving. Human nature is a problem. There are accidents, there's a potential for deliberate harm, there's cost cutting, there's corner cutting, especially if you have a profit model. Complacency and loss of safety culture, which set into the waste isolation plant in New Mexico, which after 15 years had to close down because they, the, the official investigation found that they'd lost the safety culture. And um, there's falsification of data, as happened in Nevada. In, um, they falsified the data around the hydrogeology. So in Nevada, not only public opposition, but also fraud. Cozy relationships with politicians make regulation very difficult and sometimes people just plain get it wrong. So from a public health perspective to close, um, this proposal creates a public health risk that was not there before and leaves a highly toxic legacy for many future generations of South Australians. As a health professional, I think this, pro this is ill-conceived and irresponsible. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'll now go to introduce Dr. Robert Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Hall. I'm a um, public health physician, so that means that uh, my specialty is prevention of disease on public health. I've um, spent a part of my career working with Aboriginal people, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country. So radioactive streams come in several different forms and what we're talking about here largely is high level um, radioactive waste which needs quite complex processing over a very long time period to um, manage it and then ultimately dispose of it. Um, and <clears throat> these processes require a pre-operational phase where the facility is designed, an operational phase where it's um, operated, and then a post-operational phase which will last for <coughs> millennia where the waste is stored underground. We have to think of um, <clears throat> operating one of these facilities as a planned radiation exposure. So this is um, an exposure to radiation that did not exist before. And we need to justify that um, exposure as doing more social good than social harm. The International Commission on Radiation Protection has a series of principles for radiation protection 
Firstly, that any radiation exposure must bring more social good than social harm, that um, radiation exposure should be optimised so that radiation doses should be as few as possible and as small as possible, and in any case, they must be within specified dose limits. The goals of uh, radioactive waste disposal are to contain the waste and then to separate it from the environment and to protect the protect humans and the environment from the risks of this material, which are both chemical and radiological. And these protections have to be maintained over an incredibly long, even geological, time scale. And we have a duty of care to future generations. We must ensure that protection of future generations is at least at the same level as um, protection of our own generation. Yet we don't know how future generations are going to behave. We don't know how their society is going to be organised. We don't know whether they will even remember that the facility exists. And we've certainly seen examples of um, contaminated sites um, from the 19th century which um, are newly discovered. In the operational phase of the, um, <coughs> of the waste disposal facility, there's a requirement for active management. And this may be for a century or more. So we need to have a very long-lived, high-level active management of, um, of this process. And then in the post-operational phase, the plan is to seal up the disposal facility where, for millennia, we will rely on passive uh, protection where there will be no management. And so the facility needs to be designed in such a way that we can assure future generations that it will be um, as safe as we can possibly make it. There will be social and economic constraints, and social and economic factors will um, apply so that um, there may be deviations from best practice, and this will prevent optimisation of protection, and we need to be convinced that firstly, that the, any constraints are transparently revealed, and secondly, that there's social agreement that making this Faustian bargain is worth it. Over the very long time periods that are involved, the possibility of um, <coughs> releases of radiation to the environment become a real risk. These are very low probability events, but they're over a very long time period. So we need to ensure that um, over these very long periods that minimisation of exposure to anybody who may discover um, this facility in the distant future when all memory of it has been lost. The first principle of waste management is to reduce waste. And um, we've had 60 years of the nuclear industry and yet we have no operational um, high-level waste disposal system in existence anywhere. Just very briefly about what some of the radiation risks are. Um, there are a number of studies looking at um, cancer risks. And this shows um, a graph of the risks of cancer in atomic bomb survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, showing that there's a linear increase in the risk of cancer. Um, dependent on dose. There are also non-cancer risks, and particularly heart disease is um, an emerging risk that's being discovered from um, radiation exposure. It appears that radiation health risk is dose dependent, and most authorities conclude that there is no threshold below which the, threat, the risk is non-existent. So the requirements for waste disposal are confinement of the waste, complete um, isolation of this waste, and then the ability over a geological time frame to have um, passive safety. This is unprecedented in history. This has never happened before. And as I mentioned, there is no operating waste disposal facility anywhere. We need to be convinced of the social benefit. We need to be transparent about any additional risk if we agree to proceed. On the other hand, we have a choice and we can maintain additional exposures at zero. We need to think about radioactive waste in the context of the use of radioactive material. We need to think about things that can go wrong and that this is untested technology. I think we're responsible for our own waste, but we have a choice about the waste of other countries. 
And then finally, as I'm from the Medical Association for the Prevention of War, we're opposed to nuclear weapons and we think that there is a risk that um, promoting nuclear industry may lead to further nuclear weapon proliferation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I should say a couple of the speakers have provided written information. I've asked them to set it on the table. If you are interested in additional information, then come up at the end and get that. There's also a speaker who was invited who was high on your list of priorities called Ian Fairley, and his, he's, written, he's submitted a written submission, which is available on Basecamp and also in the resource area. So just so you know, that material is there if you're interested. Okay, and I will now introduce um, Stefan Bayer. Good afternoon. I come from the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office, which is um, based within the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra, but we act our, under our own separate legislation, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Safeguards Act. I'm he here on behalf of John Carlson, who could not make it. He's pictured in the middle there, and his alternate actually first was Dr. Robert Floyd, the current Director General of our office, he couldn't make it either, so I'm plan C, <laughs> but I hope I do them justice. Our office handles, in respect of what we're discussing here, three main areas. One is nuclear cooperation. Uh, we handle the nuclear cooperation agreements under which we export uranium, which is the beginning of the fuel cycle process. Of course, we're discussing the end, the final disposal. We cover nuclear security, so that's um, addressing the theft and possible sabotage of material, of nuclear material, and also the IAEA safeguards that is applied. And that is the regime under which we uh, ensure that material that we have is, remains in peaceful use and is not diverted to weapons. Australia has a treaty obligation uh, not to do that. Now, this session is titled Safety, but Security and Safeguards if they're done right, all work well together and they follow a, sim a similar regulatory process. In other words, legislation governs the higher level requirements. You can then promulgate regulations, individual license requirements, and then you have a regulatory regime which includes inspections and the like. And these, in addition to addressing safety, my office addresses security and the safeguard side of the equation. And if they're done right, they all work well and mutually reinforce, although there are also differences between each one. Now, in terms of nuclear security regulation in Australia, my office, as no, covers the security of nuclear materials, so that is uranium and plutonium, but also um, these items are radioactive, and so there's separate regulation that covers that side, but we work very cooperatively. And that's because all the standards are, in the end, developed in the IAEA. And so we follow international best practice standards. They're not just invented within Australia. There is a very large body of expertise that has been developing safety and security and safeguards requirements over many, many years. And we work very closely with them uh, to ensure that Australia follows best practices. And here, just the sum of the guideline documents uh, on security, safety as well, has a very well-developed series of documents that helps countries for particular parts of the fuel cycle uh, to make the best safety and security regimes. In terms of uh, keeping our technical competence up, as was mentioned in Dr. Loy's presentation, we make sure we go out to the actual facilities around the world to make sure we have a good understanding. Uh, one of my colleagues recently visited the Onkolo facility in Finland, just to again have a sound understanding of how safeguards and security would work there. And so that for any uh, facility that might be contemplated in Australia, we've gained at least expertise from what is done around the world. Also, we 
make sure we are part of international efforts to, to improve security and safeguards around the world. Over the last six years, there's been four nuclear security summits where over 50 world leaders have gone together to discuss the very subject of nuclear security and make sure that is the best it can possibly be and to reduce risks around the world. So it's a very important topic that has attracted um, you know, national leaders' interest and, and it has done a lot of good work to reduce risks over those years. And so we were very much plugged into that process and Australia has seen a leader in this area. So to address the overall question, uh, should or could we pursue the opportunity? And from a regulator's point of view, we have no yes and no answer to whether we should, but whether we could, we say that it is possible under open and transparent international best practice safeguards and security, and we need to do it in such a way that gives everyone confidence that it is best practice. Not just to say, trust us, it's okay, and don't tell you anything. We have to do the effort to make sure that everyone has the, tr the trust and confidence that indeed such a situation is safe and secure. Thank you. Okay, and I'll hand over now to um, Dr. Tony, sorry, Professor Tony Hooker. Tony Hooker, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mel. Um, I've got a lot of slides, and I'm typically, uh, I think, the longest speaker. So, um, what I'd like to do is just say, I start off saying that I am a radiation regulator here in South Australia, and just for your information, we have 11,000 licences and registrations uh, that we look after. Um, we have um, uh, uh, about 200 uh, radioactive shipments um, every week coming through South Australia. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is try, uh, we often talk about radiation um, and there's an old saying in toxicology, it's not the agent, it's the dose. So what I'm going to try and do today is try and put some perspective in the radiation dose that we're commonly exposed to. So here in Australia, um, background radiation is around three, three millisieverts per year. This is actually increasing due to the increase uh, in medical uh, radiation. Um, but we are exposed to radiation on a daily basis. Everything we eat and drink uh, contains radiation. So this is um, Adelaide produce, actually, which uh, was undertaken uh, at the Women's and Children's Hospital and pretty much demonstrates that uh, of the things that were looked at all contain radiation. Um, so what doses are we ex uh, exposed to? So, so the world average background is around 2.4 millisieverts. You as members of public are only allowed one millisieverts a year above background. Um, the average background or the, in the US is around six millisieverts per year. Uh, airline crews get around nine millisieverts a year. If you have a CT, you'll get around 10 millisieverts. This is the same as what you'd get average dose in the Sh Chernobyl exclusion zone. Uh, people like myself, I'm allowed 20 millisieverts a year. I'm actually allowed 50 millisieverts in one year but it has to average out to 20 over five years. Now, some of the background levels actually vary all around the world. So which, which background uh, level do we use? So some countries have backgrounds 50 millisieverts, some up to 160 millisieverts. Um, so it is quite a complex and, and confusing story. So the models of radiation risk that we have, so regulators tend to use this linear no threshold model uh, we know up here from A-bomb survival data that there is a linear risk. The more radiation you get, uh, the higher incidence of cancer. However, what below 100 millisieverts, the story is, 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 very, is very difficult to see. And so for every curve that we have here, we will find biological data to fit that curve. So radiation risk, what do we know? So it's generally accepted that doses of radiation above 100 millisieverts uh, can induce cancer effects. However, below 100 millisieverts, if there is a cancer risk, it's difficult to see in the background noise. And as I said in my previous talk, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but 50% of the people in this room will get cancer and 30% of people will die from cancer. So 
The low dose radiation research has provided a large body of data which demonstrates little or no health effects at low doses and there's, quite, there's, there's two major reviews which have shown that. Um, but there's also work published uh, which does project cancer effects. So again, the story is very confusing. So two, two major scientific committees, so the BF5 committee uh, in 1990 indicated that if you get a 10 millisievert dose of radiation, a CT scan, that your risk of cancer, uh, cancer death is 0.08%. So what that means is if you have a CT scan, your risk goes from 30% to 30.08%. We cannot see that in epidemiological studies. Um, that was revised down um, in 2007. So although the linear no threshold model is preferred uh, for regulators for regulating, um, we have had um, a more recent uh, science that the United Nations have, have said more recently that it shouldn't be used to estimate uh, the number of radiation induced cancer um, or health effects, at, certainly at low doses. So what does the a review of the epidemiological studies tell us? So what we can see here, if you have a risk above one, then there is some indication that your risk of cancer is increased. If it's below one, then you don't have an increased risk. As you can see, around 10 millisieverts, um, about a CT scan, there's very few studies which show that there's any excess risk, certainly um, uh, in the nuclear workers. But this does increase with much higher doses, above 100 millisieverts, which is what we expect based on the science. Now I will point out that none of the relative risks are above two. Now if you drink alcohol, uh, two drinks of alcohol every day, your risk is between two and three. If you're obese, your risk is between three and four. If you're a smoker, your risk is 25. So if you're somebody like me who likes a burger and a beer, you're in trouble. So what are the doses uh, to radiation workers that we do know of. Now this is in the uh, Royal Commission report, I don't want to uh, reiterate too much apart from there's very little information here which says that you're going to get above a 10 millisievert dose. Transport, um, there's been no accidents resulting in release. You can actually stand, so type B packages, these are delivered by ANSTO, about two, <coughs> 220 every week. You can actually stand, the regulations state that they can't be more than 100 microsieverts an hour measured at two metres from the cast, which means a member of public can stand next to one for 10 hours. Storage. I actually visited an above ground storage facility last year in Canada. Um, so this is, the, this is all of the radioactive waste from 16 years of operation of a nuclear power plant in Canada. Um, I received no radiation dose and, uh, uh, and you have to remember that in that part of the country, the temperature goes from minus 30 to plus 30. So I'll just conclude. Um, basically, all radioactive material is highly regulated, even at low doses, and that's to ensure that we're protecting the people and the environment from harmful effects of radiation. There can never be no risk, um, but we're constantly ensuring best practice. And, um, and per, from my own personal perspective, the only thing new here, nuclear uh, companies are actually storing this waste on site at the moment. The only thing new here is that we're proposing a more permanent solution. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, don't forget to be noting your questions as in six minutes exactly, you're gonna have the chance to think about them more. So. Let me, um, with that, hand over to Jim Green for the final presentation. Thanks, Jim. Uh, th thanks, Mel, and um, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to draw attention to that website, which has quite a lot of papers that may be of interest. Uh, and also, I've got a, a, a four-page paper, which you're welcome to pick up if you haven't already got it. I want to talk about the bias which has infected this process throughout, first of all, uh, the government chose a royal commissioner who's a nuclear advocate, which is fine, but they should have had a panel, including people with different perspectives. Uh, most of the members of the royal commission's advisory panel were and are nuclear advocates. Uh, there wasn't even one token critic on the staff of the royal commission. And now the process has been handled to the South Australian government's consultation and response agency, and it doesn't have one token critic on it. So there's a systemic bias here. And this has all sorts of implications and it's influencing this citizen's jury process. And I'll give you one example. 
uh, and there are many, but one example concerns the economics. The Royal Commission got one consultant to come up with an economic model. That consultant has got clear links to the nuclear industry, uh, and yet that was that their information, their modelling was not peer reviewed, it was not independently tested. So we've got one biased model to, uh, to, to base our economic assumptions on. Um, and that speaks volumes about the bias of the Royal Commission. And now the so-called consultation and response agency is using that uh, highly questionable information as the basis for its so-called consultation process around the state. And we would all agree that if six economists were asked to report on the economic viability of this project, they would come up with six different answers. So clearly there's a need for independent uh, perspectives and a variety of perspectives, but we simply haven't got it. And Jay Weatherall told this jury when he spoke to you that he wants a red, amber or green light. But if you were listening carefully, what he actually said is that he regards an amber light as a licence to proceed with caution, in his own words. So he regards an amber light as a licence to proceed. So when it comes time to write your report, uh, please, if you're concerned and opposed to this proposed nuclear waste dump, then don't regard an amber light as a, as a sensible compromise. It will be taken by the state government as a licence to proceed. I just want to draw attention to the point that we're not just talking about nuclear waste being buried deep underground. Uh, you're talking about a range of different facilities, three nuclear waste dumps, plus a port, uh, plus interim above ground stores, uh, and various other facilities as well. And uh, a number of those processes are potentially more risky than, than the, the high level nuclear waste repository itself. It's quite bizarre that the government and the Royal Commission are proposing to import the waste first before a repository is established. And that's bizarre because of the history of failed nuclear waste repository proposals in Australia and around the world. Around the world, no country has got a, a functioning high level nuclear waste repository. And there are many examples of proposals that have failed. For example, in the US, Yucca Mountain was advanced for some 20 odd years and $13.5 billion was wasted on it before that was abandoned. So if the proposal was to go ahead in Australia, clearly you would need the repository to be established first before you imported any nuclear waste. So there are a range of contradictions here. There's a contradiction that we should uh, accept high level nuclear waste, even though Australia has a long way from sorting out our own problems with low and intermediate level waste. And the pro proposition is that we should import foreign waste, again, before we've sorted out solutions for our own domestic waste. And keep in mind that there have been repeated attempts to establish a national repository in Australia, and they've all failed, and this has been going on for 20 years. And the current proposal is to dump nuclear waste on Aboriginal land in the Flinders Ranges, despite the near unanimous opposition of the traditional owners. And that's going to fail again. So we'll go, we're going around in circles with our own relatively small holdings of low and intermediate level waste. Um, that quote is on the handout. I'll skip over that. The claim that there haven't been accidents involving the release of radiation during transport is clearly false. Um, uh, you can. Uh, read the paper here and look at the website and there's plenty of examples of accidents. Some of them have involved releases. The most spectacular was a scandal in Western Europe in the late 1990s which, re which resulted in the suspension of nuclear waste transports for several years. This, we're not talking about an obscure incident in Siberia 50 years ago. This is recent history and it was a major international scandal and it did involve radiation releases and exposures. Um, I'll skip over that. Uh, and of Australia's track record, this is a quote from a nuclear engineer. As you'd expect, he supports the nuclear industry and he's summarising experiences around Australia and he says, the disposal of radioactive waste in Australia is ill-considered and irresponsible, whether it's short-lived waste from Commonwealth facilities, long-lived plutonium waste from an, an atomic bomb test site on Aboriginal land, or reactor waste from Lucas Heights. The government applies double standards to suit its own agenda. There's no consistency and little evidence of logic. Now, that is no basis to be proceeding with a, a vastly more risky, complicated uh, project involving the importation of 138,000 tonnes of high-level nuclear waste. And I'll finish by mentioning the world's one and only deep underground nuclear waste dump. I, I said there's no operating high-level repository uh, for high level waste, but there is one for intermediate level waste. It's in the United States 
and it was closed two and a half years ago because of a chemical explosion. And it speaks volumes about the dishonesty and bias of the state government and the Royal Commission that they have said so little about this. There are obvious lessons to be learnt from this, uh, from this chemical explosion and the main lesson, and I'll finish on this point, is that the half-life of nuclear waste is measured in centuries and millennia, but what this chemical explosion shows is that the half-life of human complacency and cost-cutting and corner-cutting is measured in years or at most decades. And I'll finish on that point. Great, thank you, Jim. A huge thank you to all our speakers for just being so tight on their timing. Um, yeah, round of applause and appreciate the work they've put in to make that so tight and convey so much information. Um, what we're going to do now is the speakers are going to come and sit at the, in, at the front. I want you to turn to the people around you, just in groups of two or three, and use your critical thinking skills. I say it again. Think of what you've heard and what your most critical questions are. I'm going to say that I really want you to keep your question tight, okay? In the last session, we had some questions with a long preamble. We can't do long preambles, okay? We need to get as many people as possible. So if you need to set the context, you need to do it in a sentence or else I'm going to get you to come to your question, okay? We are going to try and get a good cross-section of the room, but take now about three minutes to talk to the people around you and work out your critical questions. Thank you. Okay. Now, Jim Green has just nipped out for a second, um, so I don't want him to miss out on the panel, but I also don't want to hold us up. So, if you have a question that you would like to ask, particularly to one of the other witnesses, then um, please go ahead. Hi, my name's Bridie. Um, my question is for Dr. Hooker. Um, do you find that exposure of um, atomic bomb releases and CAT scans in babies are a valid comparison for this project if it were to go ahead? Um, well, they are actually quite different because they're different types of uh, radiation. So, obviously, atomic bomb uh, uh, survivors were exposed to, um, um, I guess, radioactive material released into the environment whereas uh, people who are exposed to CT scans uh, are exposed to X-ray. So they are quite different. Um, I guess um, the, the point is, is that it's the dose which is uh, important. We do have correction factors for uh, internal doses, 
um, and also for ex external doses. Um, but the dose at the end of the day is their effective dose. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Bayer. Um, have any, has Finland in particular found it necessary to introduce any other regulations uh, over and above the framework set by the IAEA? I haven't studied that in detail. I know on the safeguard side, this is you know, one of the first of its kind, and so they the safeguarding requirements and the setup have been developed uh, as it was being built, and so they're quite new, and so they wouldn't be adding anything necessarily additional on top of that. But each country, of course, makes its own sovereign decisions, guided by the international ones, but they could make higher ones. So I, I don't know the detail of whether they have, but they certainly can choose to do so. Hi, Charles Matheson to Dr Hooker again. Um, can you please advise what level uh, we could expect the background radiation to increase from a, such a facility as being proposed? Uh, I would hope for a member of public that it wouldn't increase the level of background radiation. Um, obviously, members of public are probably not going to be allowed access to any such facility. Um, obviously the radiation workers there uh, will be exposed to some levels of uh, radiation, uh, but they will be under their normal occupational uh, radiation worker dose. Um, I think it's important to be clear that in theory, um, indeed the radiation levels will be very low. The problem with um, isolating waste is it hasn't been done before, that they've all had either radiation releases that have given unintended exposures. So I think whilst it would be reassuring to be confident that the radiation level is going to remain low, the problem is for if what goes wrong, and that's highly likely. Uh, I have a question for Dr John Loy. Uh, you mentioned just on your slides so that one of the way regulator enforce uh, the, the regulation uh, is uh, you can order stop work, but if this thing were to go ahead, now what kind of methods are available to regulator to en ensure that people follow? You cannot stop work, you cannot send it back. Well, you can stop work. You can order the operation to shut down and stop for a period of time to repair the non-compliance. And the regulator needs to have that power. You'd prefer the operator to stop work and not, not require an order from the regulator, but the legal power to order to stop work needs to be with the regulator. And they can stop work by stopping the activities undertaken, whether it be encapsulation of the plant or the stacking of the, of the waste in the repository, until the, re, uh, the non-conformance is fixed. Now, ultimately, when you're looking at the geological time scale, you can't stop the work there when you're just relying upon the geology of the, of the disposal facility to protect people. But you, 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 I imagine the future regulators, a long time in the future, will have some measurement capacity and be able to intervene if necessary, but that's, that's really quite imaginary stuff. Um, Dr. Robert Hall, um, when you were saying that will we remember that these sites exist in the future and then you made a statement that there have been newly discovered sites, could you please expand on that? Thank you. So one of the issues is that with the very long time periods involved, there may be forgetting, social forgetting of where these repositories are and what they are. And the example I gave was for um, contaminated industrial sites from the 19th century, for instance, where these have been lost and they're, they're not nuclear sites, they're chemical contaminations, and um, they've been newly discovered by people in the last, say, 20 odd years, um, where the social memory of, um, of those sites has been lost. I just add one thing to that, that so long as the facility 
um, is there, and so long as the International Atomic Energy Agency exists, they will know about that place because they'll continue to monitor it from an IAEA safeguards point of view. So, yes, over many centuries and millennia, you can imagine where perhaps there's a world with no more reactors, they've all been shut down, none of this happens anymore, they've all been decommissioned. Perhaps, you know, you could think of a plausible thing where maybe it's forgetting, but this is really very, very long time frames you're talking about. Um, I think this waste needs isolation for 10,000 to 100,000 years. 5,000 years ago, we had the pharaohs in Egypt, so we're talking very long time frames. Hi. Um, I just want to get my head around the uh, regulation and legal framework because I uh, just want to understand. So if we were to get a regulator, maybe to look into having a regulator, we'd have to, just clarifying, do we have to change the South Australian legislation for that to happen? And then I want to understand if this has never done but been done before, then there would be no international regulations, so that would all have to be done as well. And Australian regulations would all need updating, changing... Yeah, I just want some clarification around all that. Well, first of all, there would have to be a piece of South Australian legislation to set up a regulator to regulate this process. And that regulation would require the, the banning of any activity unless it was licensed by the regulator. It would establish the regulator as an independent body capable of making decisions to license such facilities and to p impose conditions on them and to issue the regulations for them. Now, whether, whether there was also some relationship with the Commonwealth and all of that, I don't know. That would be a matter for negotiation. But in terms of what the international regulations are, there are international safety standards for disposal of radioactive waste and spent fuel that exist now. The point is that they haven't been fully applied anywhere yet because of the, the, the issues that have been discussed but they're being applied by Finland and Sweden and France even as we speak. But so they are extant. There are international regulations or high-level regulations that can be used for the Australian situation. Yes. My understanding is our country has imported this level of waste, though. So is there any regulations around that sort of stuff? Well, in fact... Yes, that's, that's true, but international transport has been regulated and, and countries have exported spent fuel to um, the UK and France, for example, for reprocessing, and the high-level waste has been returned to those countries. So there is experience in regulation of transport of these materials, but no country has accepted other countries' waste for disposal. That's true. Hello, um, Alison. My question is to... Um, Dr. Bayer. Uh, early in, November, in December last year, um, nuclear waste was transported to Port Kembla from France on a ship BBC Shanghai, which the US um, has basically blacklisted for that level of waste. How can we be assured that this kind of thing will not be the mainstream um, type of ship used to transport waste in the future? Because in the end, it's the regulator who will decide and assess on the best practice basis what is allowed in terms of the vessels and the ships. I know there's a lot of um, ex experience from the UK sending waste back and forth from UK and Japan. That particular shipment went through with no problems and no issues, so the canister's safely resting at and so at the moment, we're waiting for a final intermediate store. I can't... Um, I mean, what happens in the future, I can assure that Australia will use best practice standards. I can't... It's a theoretical question for what will actually happen, but uh, Australia will always follow um, best international practice. That's not one I particularly regulated. I'll have to... Um, Arpanza would be the one who would comment on that. So it's just a subtlety between of the type of nuclear material. So I would have to do some research to address that one in particular. But, yeah. 
Just very quickly, two examples of failed regulation here in South Australia. One was the illegal disposal of low-level radioactive waste in the Akarula Wilderness Sanctuary just a few years ago. The South Australian regulator did not detect that illegal disposal of, of low-level radioactive waste. That's a failure. Another one, uh, uh, multiple leaks in the tailings dam at Olympic Dam, in the tailings dams at uh, the Olympic Dam uranium and copper mine. The regulator did not force BHP Billiton to fix those mines and when that was revealed in the media, BHP Billiton's response was to threaten disciplinary action against any worker court taking photos of the mine site. So the proposition is essentially that regulation now is substandard and problematic, uh, but that we should just trust the government to regulate a high level nuclear waste facility properly and there's just a serious mismatch between current practices and those promises. Um, I would just reiterate that the South Australian record on regulating nuclear issues is poor. Hi, I'm Sandra from Wyala. Um, living in a regional area, we've seen a retraction of our health services over the years. Um, you can't even have a baby in Wyala if you're overweight. So what do you think is the capacity of our regional health sector to actually um, monitor or respond to a crisis in this in this location. What's interesting with nuclear waste is that they don't often predict what the pattern of the crisis may be. I cannot tell you what the response would be. What I can say is that as a GP, one of the things that really concerns me about this proposal is that if down the track it costs the government billions, which it has the potential to do, given it hasn't been independently modelled. If this costs the South Australian community billions, the health services will be further cut. And that's what really bothers me, that this could cost in terms of health and education and public health in that regard. Um, I guess I can only speak because we don't have high level waste here at the moment, but um, the EPA runs a 24-7 emergency response uh, to radiation emergencies here in South Australia. So we exercise uh, routinely for dealing with some of the scenarios that we might be encountered um, in, in any future accident. Uh, thankfully, we rarely have them. Um, so I would imagine that uh, uh, if high-level waste was to come into uh, South Australia, that, uh, that the safety case would have to include emergency response. Right? We, we struggle to get GPs, we struggle to get allied help, and I work in the health sector. So I can tell you now from Roxby Downs, basically down the coast, down the coast to Adelaide, we are in short supply, like we've got high demand, short supply of trained staff. How are we going to get nurses who could respond and measure and, and look after the needs of workers? Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a question for SA Health, probably. Yeah. So. Hi, I just have a question about um, the pro proliferation issue. Is it even possible to create atomic weapons from the type of waste and in the form that it's going to be in that we would be receiving under this proposal? So to go, to put two bounds on the question, from the total capacity of the proposed facility, the amount of uranium and plutonium it would hold is, yes, has potential for thousands of weapons, right? But it's not as though you just take it out and stick it into a weapon and off you go. The uranium is typically enriched to about 3%. You need to get to 90% for a weapon. So one would have to have an enrichment facility. You just don't make that overnight, and Australia doesn't have one. For the plutonium, you'd need to reprocess that. Okay, similarly, a dedicated facility. There are not many around the world. Australia doesn't have one. And, and it's almost easy to start from scratch. So in other words, you also have in our unused uranium mines across Australia also potentially nuclear weapons sitting there, but you need to put it through the whole process. So no, it's not readily accessible for a nuclear weapon. One of our issues is that you have to think about the entire industry and um, having a waste disposal facility removes one of the back-end constraints 
on the nuclear industry and um, we've seen in many countries that so-called peaceful use of nuclear um, technology has been used as a blind to cover development of weapons. So we think that this would be an additional loosening, if you like, of um, one of the controls on um, nuclear proliferation. Great. We've just got a few minutes left, so I'm going to move on to another couple of questions. Hi, I don't know who on the panel could answer this, but um, I just wondered if there was anything where you could provide any contextual information about how the risks of this industry compared to other industries, because obviously there's many dangerous industries, death on construction sites is still um, an occurrence, um, you know, there's different related industries for different occupations, and I guess, is there any information, this industry does exist now, waste is being stored, um, about how dangerous this industry is really in context to other industries? There are risks with many industries and um, the risks for workers generally in well-regulated nuclear industries are not extremely high. I guess my main point is that this is an additional risk that we can choose to take on or not. And my argument would be that we already have a lot of risks um, for health in the society and we can choose not to take this on and uh, I would advocate in the interests of health that we make that choice. Um, the Royal Commission gives uh, these theoretical assessments which purport to demonstrate that the risk of a serious accident is, is minuscule. Um, but we've got the real world experience of the, the waste dump in the United States that I mentioned, the world's one and only deep underground nuclear waste dump, and they had one serious radiation release accident in the space of just 15 years. Uh, and 22 workers were exposed to radiation, and it exposed uh, multiple levels of, of safety failures and regulatory failures. And the reason I mention that is because I'm worried that South Australia is not nearly so well equipped as the United States is to deal with a project like this. The United States has got vastly more experience, vastly more expertise, and I'm really disturbed at the prospect of trying to convince qualified nuclear experts from the US and North America and Western Europe and elsewhere to go and live in northwest South Australia. I don't think it's going to happen. I think we might have a safety B team up there. Okay. We've got... One super quick question right here, who's been waiting ages, and then we're done. Um, I've had people in the community ask me um, if it's safe to stand next to the big water ponds where it's cooling, and I think it was you, we saw a photograph of you standing next to the big cylinders outside. Um, so what, at what stage does it become so unsafe inside all those layers um, that we have to bury it so far under the ground and worry about it forever. Um, I've actually got a picture of me standing above the reactor core, uh, above the uh, cooling pond, so... Um, and you actually received no radiation. Um, look, what we're discussing here is a permanent solution to remove radioactive material. Um, so to actually find a, a, a final disposal solution. At the moment, it's stored above ground uh, in those facilities like I showed you. Um, those canisters are designed so that there is very little radiation which will come off that and expose a radiation worker to excess radiation. So there is some radiation? Uh, there will always be some radiation. And as I said, it was 100 microsieverts an hour at two metres which, um, to put that into context, that, so when you fly from Adelaide to Sydney, you get 10 microsieverts. So it's a chest x-ray. Um, I think there's two scenarios here. If you stand next to a used fuel assembly outside one of those pools, you'll get a lethal dose in seconds. The question is, does the shielding work and will it work for 10,000 or 100,000 years? The, no, 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 no. They're shielded. The, the, the question is getting that uh, radiation into the environment, and then it's not just a matter of standing there for 10 minutes. The people in Fukushima can't go back because they want to live there. They want to have children there. They want to grow up there. So it's the long-term exposures to... Okay. 
It's, it's an accident. It's an, it's, it's, if, it, if the storage works as well as they say it will, fantastic. But if it doesn't work and it hasn't worked, it's a problem. Yeah, I'll just make one, one quick comment in that all radiation um, which is used even in the medical area, uh, nuclear medicine, nuclear industry, we have shielding requirements. So there's rooms which are shielded, for example, in hospitals. That is to protect uh, the workers as well as the members of public. We know a lot about radiation. We know a lot about its, um, uh, its activity, its, its principles of emission, and based on that, we can design shielding to effectively protect us. Mm -hmm.